I do what I like to do. I'm always excited. Hey, welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast. Well, that sounded really wacky. <laughs> welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, founder and podcast producer at Max Podcasting. And you can email me at max at maxpodcasting.com to save time with your high-quality podcast. This is episode When I'm 264, as the song goes. And today's guest is Cheryl McLean. Cheryl is the president and creative director of McLean and Turquie, one of the most fun or funnest names to say. And McLean and Turquie is an award-winning full-service interior design firm that's been around since 2003. Cheryl is actually the first black woman to ever get her master's in architecture from UCLA. And in this episode, we talk her design and architecture roots, her previous career as an international flight attendant, not that there's any stories there, the value of finding a business coach or multiple business coaches, and Cheryl's brilliant approach to inspiration and creativity. It is Cheryl McLean, formerly Tukui. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are here with Cheryl McLean of McLean and Turquie, a name I've been pronouncing uh, for about several, I think seven years straight now. <laughs> but Cheryl, so excited to speak with you and, and talk all about your design and architecture journey and beyond. Uh, and as a bonus, you share the same first name as my father-in-law. So shout out Cheryl's with an S all around. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. And also, I, I totally blacked out there. I don't know if I just said father-in-law, but I meant mother-in-law. But anyway, uh, <laughs> no, really, really excited to, to dive into it. But before that, uh, there's an area of your background that uh, in a, a previous stop along your career that's extra interesting to me, and that is you spent many years as an international flight attendant. And I think that's something that I think so many of us are really interested in as just one, you know, if you like travel, it's kind of like an intriguing thing, but also you got to have stories on stories on stories and you've literally been all around the world uh, and you get paid to be all around the world. So that's pretty cool. But what made you want to become a flight attendant in the first place? It had nothing to do with being a flight attendant. It had everything to do with traveling. And that is the truth. That was the cheapest way that you could go and and be everywhere. And I'm a very, very curious person. I'm curious about everything, cultures, people, and what a better way to find out about the world than to, as you say, get paid to travel and learn about all the crazy people on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it seems like more and more and more. What made the difference for you of, you know, just liking the idea of travel to, wait, actually, yeah, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fully commit to this and become a flight attendant for, for multiple years. At that time, I was working for IBM. I have several careers, <laughs> but I was working for IBM and I was doing very, very well, but there was something that was really lacking and missing. And I decided that what the path that I was on was a path that was expected of me and not a path that I just freely chose because that's what I wanted to do. So I was in this weird space where it's like, okay, what is going to fulfill you right now? Some of my purse strings were being pulled from the design aspect, but I didn't have any experience or even knew of any designers. And then the other was, I don't want to live in Los Angeles anymore. I got to get out of here. And how am I going to get out of here? And just so happens, seriously, that the at that time they called them secretaries. The secretary of uh, that particular office that I work in, her brother was interviewing for United Airlines. Now, mind you, in LA in my days, I didn't know what United was. United wasn't traveling on the on the West Coast then. And I'm like, hmm. She says, sure, you'll make such a great flight. Att well, then airline stewardess. I'm like, okay, I don't know about that. I'm in IBM. I'm doing well. Would I give up all of this to travel? Yes. 
<laughs> yes, I thought it was going to be a temporary pause. I thought it'll move me out of LA, situate me somewhere for two years, have some fun, and then I could get back to the real world, whatever the real world was supposed to be, because I really didn't know at that time. And sure enough, the next day, she had uh, set me up with an interview, and the next week, I was in Chicago training. <laughs> so, so that's how that started. It, you know, it's weird. A lot of my life is like that. You think, oh my God, you spent years thinking and dreaming of this. No, it kind of came my way. It felt right. And I did it. I'm sort of that person. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think so many entrepreneurs have that characteristic of like, they know ultimately that they want to start a business one day or they want to kind of build their life around things that they're passionate about, but the also keep the door open for like, you know, like there's no blueprint to, you know, to tie it back to design and architecture. <laughs> there's no blueprint for like, you have to do this step, then this step, then this step. Like you never know what opportunities can come your way. So that's awesome that you jumped on the flight and then got paid to be on the flights, which is awesome. <laughs> but uh, I, I am curious, do you have a like a crazy or or, or most memorable story from uh, your time as a flight attendant? Oh, I got lots of them. So <laughs> I was international, so of course I do. I, I think the most memorable though, it's it's not even that well, it sounds more luxurious than what it probably was, but it I it was a crew that I was flying out of DC. We flew together all the time. We were flying to Milan. There are certain passengers, when you fly the same routes for a period of time, they're flying the same routes you you do. Businessmen are almost on the same, same schedule as, as the flight attendants. So you get to know your first class passengers because you see them, you know, two, three times a month. And there was some kind of mechanical or something that was wrong. He was staying at the same hotel as we were staying. All I know is we were stuck there instead of a 24 hour night, we were stuck there for like four days. In that four days, this gentleman <laughs> took us to Venice, took us to, he rented this like big limo. We went up to the Swiss Alps. And I mean, it was just like one thing after another, after another. I'm on Lake Como on a boat. This is all on a layover. Lake Como one night, it's like, well, let's go deep into Italy. Let's go to Lake Como. And he's navigating all this. We're just like, sure. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was probably the most memorable because it was really like a true vacation on the highest level. Because for somebody to pay for, you know, 10 flight attendants plus two of the pilots to hang out with you, it's a pretty penny. So this person was of means and went to some of the best restaurants while I was there. So that was really interesting on that level, but every country has something to offer. So that, you know, that was my European best. And then I had a Brazilian best and I've had Argentina best. You know? So it just depends on what country you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That, that, that's fun people to know and, and work with and, and be your clientele when they can, uh, you know, instead of you just sitting around at a hotel for four days, take you to some of the coolest cities in the world. We're actually, my wife Dana and I are watching Succession at the time of this recording. And uh, some of those episodes, they just hop from, you know, Milan to like Como to Tuscany to uh, all through Europe. And it's like, you you live that, you know, why, why not go here next? So <laughs> that's that's an awesome story. And then you you hinted at it that you had an interest in design, how does one go from flight attending, <laughs> if that's the term, to design and architecture? Once again, <laughs> I kind of came my way. Design was always a passion as a child. I was the kid that designed all of my friends' rooms. You know, that was just part of who I was. I had the vision. I always was very sensitive to color. And that was a creative part of me that was God-given, no question. But I didn't know anything about making it a profession. I didn't even know that that it could be a profession for my world. So when I started flying, I'm exposed to some of the most beautiful places in the world. And I was just sapping it in. Just, oh, my God, this is it. This is it. Being a flight attendant, you have a lot of flexibility in your time. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go to school. I need to take this a little further. Mind you, I'm 12 years out of, you know, out of college by now. I need to take this a little further. So I, I started an interior design program, as a matter of fact, at UCLA. I was in it a year. I was their star. 
which I thought was funny because I never considered myself a star, but they considered me their star. And they encouraged me to go into architecture. And I'm like, I don't know any architecture. I don't know. It's the way I design. I design very three-dimensionally and they recognized it. And they said, you really need to pursue this. So I put my portfolio together with no expectation and sent it in, got accepted and got full scholarship, the whole bit. <laughs> it was like, wow, what a ride. Loved it, had all kinds of stuff because it was very political about me being there. I was the first black female actually to graduate from UCLA. So there, with that, there's all kinds of politics and racism. And yeah, the whole world was like crazy at that time. But I loved, I was passionate about design. I was passionate about architecture, really. So that's kind of how I flipped. And this was a time when the airlines were trying to lay off people. So when I put in for a leave of absence to go to school for three years, they're like, sure, go, just fly in the summers. <laughs> and that's what I did. I went to school and I flew in the summers. I didn't quit right away. I kept it for a few more years. I was still flying. But by that time, I was senior enough that I would only fly on the weekends. And I moved myself to D.C., started working for an architecture firm four days a week so that I could fly on the weekends. And I did that for a while. And then I was laid off and I said, okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to go in design? Well, by, by that time I started doing my little projects and then 9-11 hit and it's like, I'm done with flying. <laughs> you know, it's just, I'm over it and I need to make this serious. And I jumped full fledged into design. And I made the decision then that I would go into interior design versus architecture. Uh, love architecture, love it passionately, but I saw a better future for me in interior design, which is why I said, okay, I'm going to make this grown-up decision and actually do it, not based on my feelings, but based on what, what's, you know, what makes sense. And that's where I went. So let's get to uh... McLean and drumroll, please. Turquoise, <laughs> which I actually I know the answer, but for, for for the listeners, I'd love for you to share. Uh, what does turquoise mean? Turquoise, I don't know what it means, but it's my maiden name. <laughs> it's what it is. <laughs> McLean is my married name. Turquoise is my maiden name. It's funny because the amount of respect I get because they think there's two people and they assume. <laughs> That the other one is a man, by the way, 100% when I'm in front of companies. They just assume that I'm the female version of McLean and Turquoise, but it's all me. <laughs> you know, that's what it is. Well, it's brilliant from a naming standpoint. For Thanksgiving every year on this podcast, I interview a family member and it's like a family special, family business special. And it's always really, really fun. And this year I interviewed my, my father-in-law, Gary, and he... Uh, and his business partner, their longtime business is called the Sample Group. And at the start, it was just two of them. And they named it Group because they wanted it to seem like more people than it was. So like that same strategy, <laughs> it's, it's brilliant. I love that. What made you decide to go out on your own and, and start your own firm as opposed to working for, I don't know if there's like a, you know, big four design firms or architecture firms, something like that? Well, I had worked for the architecture firms. I did, you know, besides my internship, when I moved here, I was working for a large firm in the DC area, but I was older then and I couldn't see myself going, you know, when I switched over to interior design, I didn't have a blueprint for how to run a business like that. So I knew I needed some kind of business model to do this. The talent was there, the creativity there, and the maturity was there, but what is the structure? So I did this. I bought one of those franchises. It was called, um, at that time, it was called Interiors by Decorating Den, which is probably the largest franchise they have. It was a decorating franchise, but it had a great business model. So I thought then, and I said, okay, I can do this for about four or five years, and then I'll just break completely off on my individual but at least I have the, the the model. That's what I needed. Well, I didn't stay that long. I only stayed a year and a half because it didn't take that long for me to realize, you got this, you don't need this. And the, there were things I wanted to do that was kind of outside of what that particular franchise was selling. And it was 
kind of clamping my style, if you know what I'm saying. It's like, because I had the architecture in me, you know, and I needed to do that too. I just decided, you know what, you could do this. And I just bit the bullet and, and walked away and, uh, you know, started my own business. And I was crazy busy for the first three years, just like outrageously busy because I didn't realize there were people that were waiting for me out there, <laughs> you know? So when I freed myself, they came. I'm like, thank you. Thank you, universe, you know? So yeah, that's kind of how it, it, everything just kind of has a natural organic flow to what where I am now. It's just the way it is. <laughs> that's the best. Like that's that's the way it should be when you organically find your way into something. You mentioned being so busy those first three years, which I think have for any, uh, and and I've lived it with my podcast production business, but for, for any business owner, it's like a, a good problem to have, but also it is a problem to have because you need to figure out quick uh, how to you know work with numbers of clients, how to manage your time, how to still have a personal life and like be there for your family. So what how how did you navigate that in those early years when you all of a sudden went from like oh, I might go on on my own to whoa whoa we I I am too busy. Me and Turquoise. <laughs> no, yeah, me and Turquoise. So <laughs> I recognized early I have to have a coach. I have to have a business coach. I have a business coach to this day. I always am under somebody's coaching mastermind program. That's how you learn. That's how you grow. That's a safe place to do it because it's a very competitive business. So you need to be in a safe place where you don't have to worry about somebody stealing your ideas or your clients or anything like that. That was key for me. Other things that were key for me was the relationships to develop the relationships rather that I had with organizations that I believed in to develop those relationships and see if I can partner with those people to and businesses to help me further grow. Now I'm involved in a couple of big organizations, well, big for me. One is Badge, which is Black Artists and Designers Guild. They're out of New York. We're all over the world. And it's all the creatives that you can imagine, creatives and Black creatives and makers. So I'm exposed to a lot of artisans, a lot of artists. We do things together. We raise money. We get scholarships, lots of good stuff that come out of that organization. And then my, you know, to the bone passion is women in business, uh, black women in business specifically, because I came out of an environment where that was just so controlled and not necessarily encouraged. So I belong to an organization called the Bow Collective, which is, you know, black owners, uh, women's organization. We're all black CEOs kind of represent the 1% the top 1% of all Black women-owned businesses, and the revenues that we have collectively is all, we're top 1% of all small businesses. So these women, they knew the business. I got the creativity. They can help me. And that's what happened. I started learning from them. Between that and my coach, I got through it all. But coaches, I think any person any business person should have a, you need a second opinion and you need somebody to kind of, to look at you both subjectively and objectively. And you're only going to find that in, in somebody like a coach or a shrink, but I went the coach way, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and shout out Bo. I, as part of prepping for this interview, I heard your interview on a, a podcast you did with Bo, uh, which is just an awesome interview all around. But uh, yeah, just absolutely incredible. I'm sure there's endless amounts to learn. Uh, on the business coach note, I, I'm not going to make you reveal all your business coaches' secrets, but is there a, a recommendation or a tweak that they had You know, around that time that you were really busy in those first few years that has been instrumental to growing the business further? Yes. And one of the things that all of them in some way taught me is to really trust my instinct and to trust myself because I got it. I got the knowledge. I just didn't know it was the fear factor is the unknown factor that kept me from making some of the steps that I needed to make. So they guided me to do it wisely, but they allowed me to be able to feel confident enough to do this. I have to, one of the things that they've all taught me is to be able to critique myself. 
without all the emotional baggage to look at what, you know, what do we need to work on? You've got to get down to the heart of it and you got to throw all the baggage out. You can't, you know, you, it, there's some of the stuff you don't want to do. Okay. You, you've been hiding it in the background of your mind for a long time, but you got to do it because it's preventing you from moving forward. So they really taught me to trust myself and to listen to that intuition and listen to my heart in a way that I didn't know how to do that on my own. And that was really beneficial. And the, and the other thing, you know, when I say, and I do, I believe every business person should have a coach, but they should have the right coach. And one coach is not going to carry you through your career. I have coaches for, you know, the coach I'm working with now, I've been working with for, I want to say, three, four years. The one before that I worked with with three years. You know when, when you need them and you kind of know when that episode is over and you need to move on to something else because they serve their purpose uh, for that particular episode. So coaches is what you need. <laughs> what do you think business owners should look for in the quote unquote right coach? They have to be able to listen to you. That's key. That, that would be a big problem if not. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are people. The other thing is there are people that are calling themselves coaches. They're sort of self-appointed names. You know, you need somebody that has a record of coaching. My coaches, I knew about them because I read their books, because I uh, was on their, they didn't call them podcasts then, or if they did, their webinars. I was in <laughs> right. the webinars. I mean, I was listening to see, is this the person that could take me for, is this person teaching me anything, number one? Is this person listening to me? I think the most important thing is to do due diligence, as I said, because there's a lot of self-appointed coaches and they're not. They're not trained in that area. And to see what some of their successes are. Like, I do know some of the groups and some of the people that they coach. And I'm looking at their success and I'm like, okay, well, if they did that and they got that person there and that person was crazy and they still got them there, then they might be able to help me. You know, So you do, you, you need to do some due diligence and you need to feel comfortable. It's a very personal thing. There's a lot of confidentiality going on there. You know, you're, you're open, you're exposed. So you have to be comfortable with that coach too. Check it out first. That's all I have to say. <laughs> That's a great tip. And on the flip side of that is that's just proof of how effective a podcast or any form like long form content, especially can be if you are a business coach or somebody that's helping out others. And not that I'm, you know, a huge fan of podcasts or anything, but uh, that, no, it's no. It, it really can be <laughs> impactful on the design side. So I'm somebody who I know very well what design is. I know somewhat well what interior design is but i would bet you know just a little bit more about interior design than i do uh, so I, i'd love to know like as far as your company and the typical projects that you usually work in what's that look like like what really gets you fired up when you have a new project and it's in you know x category just know that i am full service i have high end residential i do commercial which is more on the when i say commercial uh, my niche is more in the corporate executive offices. Only branded interiors do I work with. I'm not there to put some desks and chairs. We have to have a whole brand thing going on or has been going on that I could connect to. That pulls on my heart right there. I do some hospitality. Uh, right now, I'm, I was work. I actually just kind of finished what my portion was on this you know, coffee house, coffee lounge kind of thing. So I do a little of that. I do multifamily also. So I'm sort of not what anybody's advising anybody to do because right now they advise you to niche yourself, but I've never niched myself in anything in my life. So I don't even know how to do that. I do what I like to do. I'm always excited when I start a new project because I only take on projects that I love or I love the people or the cause or something. There has to be something there for me to connect to. Otherwise, I'll just move to the next person and see if that person's going to do it for me. I want to love what I do. I want to continue to love what I do. I really babysit that idea when I'm when I'm out there. I'm interviewing clients as much as they're interviewing me. And I don't take all business because of that. Sometimes that sounds crazy when you're starving, but I'm I'm in here for the longevity of it, so I got to do it that way, you know. 
So to answer your question, I do everything. What gets me going is their excitement because I'm excited. So they're automatically excited. <laughs> you know what I mean, the challenge is to keep that excitement going through the process. That's the challenge. <laughs> How dare you want to love what you do? I, that's so controversial. I can't believe. No, that's that's such a strong approach to it. And I think that will resonate with so many people about, yeah, it helps to get really good at a certain skill and be niched down or niche down, whatever you prefer. But also I think people really appreciate variety and doing projects in different spaces. And you're an example of that. I know I'm the same way as well. Like if I was working on the same exact genre of stuff all the time, I would go crazy, but lots of different areas or lots of different projects is what keeps you really excited. What would you say differentiates your firm as far as, you know, your approach to the actual interior design work that you do? Of course, one of the strongest things that differentiates me is the fact that I came out of the architecture world. So my perspective starts with that three-dimensional structure kind of thing, but also in that you've got the history of that structure, that area, that community, that sort of thing is going on in my mind. I'm coming at design with a lot of knowledge. And let me just put it in that perspective. The other thing that differentiates me is I have a love for color. So you see color in my designs. Do I do uh, neutral environments, especially with the generation that is that is existing now that is just starting in design? They're very, very neutral. Yes, I can do it. Will I try to convert you to play with a little color? Yes. Because color, it's free. <laughs> you know, it's what nature gave you. It's all out there. And it's it sets the mood. It sets the tone. You physically react to color. That's why in certain hospitals there, you know, and you go in the emergency room or in the operating rooms, they're always uh, blue. They're not pink. And when you go in places where you have very, you know, volatile, emotional people, they're not going to have a red room because you physically have a reaction to that. So I love to use color to get that emotion that you want when you when you walk into a space. People are afraid of color, so it's always a challenge. They are. I've never been. That might be for my travel. No, it can't even be for my travels. It's got to be just how I grew up. Because my mother, she used to paint. I, both of my parents were very creative. So my mother used to paint. Her occupation was a teacher. But she used to paint, and she made all the clothes that she had, and they were fabulous, seriously fabulous. And so I learned textile and color and mixing stuff from her. My father was on the building side. I learned all the structure stuff. It's like I just got, they just put it in me <laughs> when they pushed me out. You know, <laughs> Color is one, the architecture is the other. And also, I get into your head. I do. I don't, I can't help it. That's my personality. You know, I'm pretty insightful. So I get into who you are and what you're going to respond to. I just get into that very, very quickly. So I know how to talk to your heart. Those those three things are the ones that have kept me in the game so long and, and has brought all the, the clients that I have. Yeah. And, and this might be me just being totally foreign to interior design, but how, in your typical project, how much time do you spend on like the early kind of research and design blueprint type part of it versus the actual like tactile, you know, buying of the goods and setup and all that. So the largest part of my time is usually in the early stages, the concept and schematic. That's when I'm putting it all together. I do do something that I don't talk about. And that is I need a day of inspiration also. So when I take on a design, I go out and get inspired by something. If it's going to a museum, if it's going to the beach Whatever I think this theme is going to come, I go visit that where that place is so I can get in touch with that a little bit. I do that first, and then I come back and I start doing concepts and schematics. And usually after my day or, or my moments or hours of inspiration, I'm ready to go. And I spend a lot of time there so that when I present, they're on board immediately and I can go right into design development. Now, that whole getting the furniture in and getting the, the contractor on board, that's like more tedious kind of things, you know, deals less with creativity. So I don't spend that much time with that. My The people that work for me do. 
but I'm on the creative end. And I think the front part of it is where I spend the most amount of time. The rest is just, okay, we know what we want. We got the colors. We got this. Let's put this puzzle together. So it goes pretty quickly. A missing puzzle piece for your podcasting and or entrepreneurship goals. Uh, or, or just, you know, if you want to be like a comedian, get really, really good at comedy because the jokes are so good. Might be the podcasting to the max newsletter. So he was right in front of you this whole time. You can sign up at maxpodcasting.com slash newsletter. And boy, oh boy, will you be happy with that puzzle and your new one-liners. Now, let's continue our segue tour. So Cheryl, you could not have segued that any better because <laughs> right now I'd love to dive into pretty much a segment I call inspiration and creativity. And you couldn't have teed it off better. Day of inspiration. I am all for that. And I think so many businesses can benefit from that. I'm curious on your end. I mean, I know you mentioned museums, but I'm sure there's plenty more uh, different activities as well. What things have you done on these the said day of inspiration that have got you most inspired and creative, creatively energized. <laughs> this is going to sound really corny, but when Beyonce came to town, I had the ability to, to be in the, the one of the suites and uh, with the Bow Collective, we had gotten a suite and everybody was there for Beyonce. And I wasn't, I was there because I was just about to jump into a project that's going to have some a little hip hop in it. I call it hip hop, which means I'm going to be dealing with a lot of color, a lot of current conversations, current political things. There's going to be some political thought that's going to go into this. I, I'm also into politics. I think they're all connected. And when I was looking at Beyonce, of whom, you know, I'm no, no different than anybody else. I loved her. Was I looking at what she was wearing? Yes, but for a very different reason. You know, I'm looking at the colors. I'm looking at the mood. I'm looking at the people. I'm taking it in because whatever that energy is, is the energy I wanted to take with me into this other project. So that was one that was kind of unusual. You go to Beyonce concert, concert for inspiration, but that's what I did, you know. I recently have been working, and we're almost finished with the uh, NARF is the Native American uh, Rights Fund. Their headquarters is in Washington, D.C., and I did their corporate office. And I went for a few times up to the Indian Museum in the Smithsonian. They have great food, by the way. But I went up there, and it was funny. I learned so much because I didn't know. I, you know, I only know what most people know if you're not around that that culture. But I just learned so much that I could bring or at least I could understand my client more. It, even if I'm not bringing in anything new, it's new to me. It's not new to them, of course. But I could understand their perspective more. So that was that's another cool thing. I have some, done something as simply as go to the beach and take my journal and just sit out there and do nothing because I needed a blank space. I needed to just kind of free myself from all the craziness just to, to create some clarity about what is it that I'm going to do with this project. So it just, it, they're all different is the point I'm making. What do you think is it about these days of inspiration or these days of, you know, pretty much unplugging, doing something energizing like that, that helps to fuel these projects so much? It creates so much clarity in my mind of what it's going to be. If you're clear on something, you could just move forward. It's like a runway. It's just clarity. I could just go for it now. And that's important because <laughs> the worst thing in the world is to get stuck on the design before you even get to the design. That's really hard. you know. By the way, I, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but you are incredible with using idioms that tie back to your career so you just use runway as a flight attendant <laughs> and, and you, you said blueprint earlier <laughs> just uh, you know casually <laughs> yeah well it's it's more than just what i speak it's it's what i do it's what i am i mean i'm a collection of everything that i've ever done you know which makes to me that's what makes me a, you want to know what distinguishes me is the collection of what i've accomplished in my life and done i carry it with me and uh, it makes me a better designer for sure. It's a fantastic runway. 
but <laughs> you, you mentioned at the beach that you take your journal. I, I would guess or guesstimate, as the kids say, that sometimes you take your journal to other places as well. What's your approach to using your journal as far as like inspiration and creativity goes? It, it depends on the moment. Sometimes I'm sketching. Sometimes I'm just uh, doodling. Sometimes I'm actually writing out my ideas. I've even like written out a, a recipe, you know, because that's what was on my mind at the time. There is no, there is no planned activity when I have that. It's just whatever I feel like doing, you know. I'm just freeing myself up when I usually am in that that kind of space. Whatever is around me that brings my attention, I might focus on. It might not have anything to do with design per se or that project. It might be something else. But for some reason, my mind wants to go there, so I just let it go. We have a couple lighter, kind of rapid-fiery segments to wrap up here. And this first one is called The Unusual. So... This is about, you don't have to tie it back to your business at all, but you on the personal side, I just love learning from entrepreneurs, you know, outside of work, what, you know, what the personalities are like, what kind of makes them tick, what makes them ticked off. (laughs) But first one is, uh, I call them weird talents. It could be a party trick or just something that you have a knack for that you're just really good at, but it doesn't, in a sense, impact the day to day. That's a hard one. And I'm saying that because I asked somebody, what do you think? weird tricks that I have. And they said, well, you're just a weird person. And I'm thinking, well, what does that mean? How did I get to be a weird person? I I love weird people. I've heard the same thing about me. (laughs) What does that mean? I don't know that answer. And I I know that that's not fair, but I really don't because I think I'm very sane. And I think there's nothing I do that's weird. I tell you what I do do that's a little different from me, especially from people that are my age. I seem to be ageless, and I accepted that about two years ago about myself because most people don't know my age because they say I don't act my age. Now, I don't know what that means, but I'm past retirement age, and I have friends in their 30s and then their 40s and their 50s and their 60s. I'm sort of, I respond to the energy and the, the you know, what you have to offer into the person, and I don't have limitations and and supposed to be's or you need to be's. I don't live by those rules. So it surprises people that when I'm, you know, I'm out and I'm partying and I'm dancing like I'm at their level, like I'm 30 years old or 35 years old. And they're looking at me like, oh, you know, they're so shocked. It's like, because I don't have those kinds of things about myself. I don't think those things. So I guess kind of that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that's an awesome trait to have. How about quirks? What's something your family, team, friends, somebody calls you out for? It's a little quirky about who you are, but it's who you are. Mm. <laughs> Once again, they all think I'm weird. I don't know what that means. <laughs> what, what do they think is not quirky? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if I had to say what they notice about me, I'm pretty spontaneous, but in a an odd kind of way. Like I don't just jump out there. I have to be spurred on in some kind of way. And then something clicks and it's like, boom, I'm very spontaneous. I'm very receptive to energies. I know that sounds so woo-woo-y and all of that, but I am. I'm very receptive to energies, always have been. So if I'm in a place where there's there's a lot of energy, I'm going to have a lot of energy. And if I'm in a place where I feel like I have to leave immediately, I will leave immediately because I don't like to get sucked in, you know? It drives them crazy because I can, and I know that that's not good, but I could answer your question before you ask it or in your sentence. And I don't mean harm. I'm just already locked into you is what it is. (laughs) We we could have done this whole interview different. I could have just said the first word and then you guessed the question and the answer. And that would have been it. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Perfect. (laughs) And I'm never, and I'm not wrong. That's the, that's what (laughs) irritates them is I'm not wrong. (laughs) Wow. That's, that's incredible. And then pet peeves. Uh, this is, and I'm referring to like minuscule things that really aren't a big deal. But so for me, for example, like I can't handle when like my wife, Dana, for example, now she does as a joke, but leaves the cupboards open or like cabinets <laughs> open or like fridge open, something like that. So what, what's something that just takes you off a little bit? <laughs> oh, no, this takes me off every day. I am crazy about this, and there's nobody else I know that I'm always on the uh, verge of road rage, really, because I just don't understand why you can't drive on your right and pass on your left. 
Okay. That's a big thing with me. So if I'm driving and yeah, I might be driving over the speed limit and you don't want to, can you move over? Cause you drive on your right and you pass on your left. It drives me crazy when people have decided what the rules are and that you have to follow the same rules they follow. So they're going to force you. It's like they deliberately are driving me crazy. <laughs> You know, force me to drive in the speed limit because they want to. Just move over. <laughs> you know? That's kind of weird, but I do this every day. I literally am mad every day about this. <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally driving you crazy. Yes. I, I, I've asked so many entrepreneurs about their, what grinds their gears, and I'm shocked. Uh, I hadn't thought about it till now, but you would think road rage comes up way more or just driving faux pas. And some people have had some comments like that, but now that that takes the cake. I'm totally with you. There's a reason why road rage is, is a thing. <laughs> yeah. Let's drive our way peacefully <laughs> to rapid fire Q&A. You ready for it? Okay. Yes. All right. Let's get wild. What is your favorite dish of the New Orleans or? Gumbo. Gumbo, gumbo, gumbo. Gumbo. So good. So good. <laughs> we, we, we make uh jambalaya a lot here. And then when, uh, shout out my, my buddy, John, when I was at his bachelor party last year in new Orleans, I think there were multiple meals that we ate out and I had both jambalaya and gumbo. I was like, why not? <laughs> of course. <laughs> so good. What is your favorite restaurant or bar in new Orleans? I don't even know if it's there anymore, but there was a restaurant called Jake's that I really, really liked. I don't know if it's there. You know, New Orleans has changed so much, but I don't eat in restaurants too much in New Orleans. You know, I'm from there, so I'm eating in at family and friends, and uh, rarely do I eat at restaurants. It's funny. I, I don't do the tourist thing when I'm home, ever. <laughs> Except, you know, I'll go get a po' boy. Now, I will go get a po' boy. That's always good as well. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm starving now. Thank you. What is a... You think your favorite thing that you kind of just casually doodled? Probably has nothing to, well, it has more to do, I'm into fashion, by the way, and beauty. I'm in the, I'm in the beauty and fashion a lot. So I sketch sometimes that kind of stuff too. So I want to say my favorite thing, which is going to be kind of odd because I needed these cowboy boots and I couldn't figure out why I hated all the ones that were out there. They were just a little too cowboyish. And so I decided, okay, let me draw some cowboy boots and, and a design on it that I think I want. It was kind of weird. I was in a weird place. And do you know, I found those cowboy boots. It's like, it's like I actually found something very similar to what I was drawing. And uh, of course I bought them, but that might be one. There's so much stuff that I, that I sketch. That, that might be a, a new way of finding the perfect <laughs> product for you. It's just sketch it and then put it out and reverse Google search it, Google reverse Google image it, and then it's got to be out there somewhere. I'm a true believer of energy out, energy in. You put it out, it's going to come back. I'm a very strong believer of that. And then back to flight attendant, I couldn't resist. <laughs> I've always wondered this. When you are on flights so often, do you just get used to your ears popping and like any potential nausea up in the sky like that? Like what, what is that like over time? I never got nauseous, and the only time my ears will pop is, now if you have a cold, you shouldn't be flying, but it might do it there. But usually, like if you're going to go, it depends on the speed of the plane, how high up they are, that sort of thing. I used to have more of that when I was flying to Japan out of New York and Tokyo. You're flying over the poles. So there's all kinds of weird stuff that's happening in your body anyway, but I don't really, I never had the nausea. I never had any of that. And by the way, I'm terribly afraid of heights, which is really <laughs> weird. You'll never get me on the edge of anything. You know, it's like, you know, or in a helicopter. It's like, I'm not doing that either. So, uh, uh, but, you know, you feel kind of safe and you're in these planes. And my planes are big. I, I don't do the, if they don't, if the plane isn't big enough to have two flight attendants and at least two pilots, it's too small. I'm not getting in that either. <laughs> on that note, do you have any tips for dealing with turbulence? Because whether you're afraid of heights or not, I just feel like turbulence is just one of those unsettling things. It's unsettling for everybody, even flight attendants. Just breathe. That's all you can do is just take a deep breath and breathe. You have absolutely no control. So just lean into it. 
because that's what's freaking you out is you don't have control. You you don't have a break. You don't have anything to, you just lose control. I mean, uh, give in to it because you're not, you don't have any control and just go with it and just breathe. Close your eyes if you have to, and just breathe, just let it go. Cause there's nothing you could do, but it scares everybody. I mean, it, it it's upsetting is what it is. That was very calming just right there. So you, you, you could tell you know your stuff. And then last one, you mentioned you started at United in that space. To this day, are you a loyal United flyer or are you kind of all over the board? Uh, no, I'm, I'm still loyal to United, but I also fly Southwest a lot too. So I like them as an airline and they go to the places sometimes. Sometimes I don't have, it depends on where I'm going. United may not fly. I, do, I still do a lot of international travel on my own. So th- these are places that I have to fly, you know, their airlines. But yeah, I'm loyal to United. United United is, you know, they were good to me. I was with them for what, 26, 28 years something. So yeah. <laughs> well, great runways all around. Cheryl, thank you so much. This has just been uh, an absolute blast and really enjoyed learning so much about your background and, and how everything's connected and uh, your amazing business. Thanks again for coming on. And where's the best place if people want to connect with you personally online as well as learn more about your business? You can go to my website, which is uh, McLean and A N D Turquie uh, T I R C. And I'll, I'll put it. I'll put it in the description. All spelled out, so we don't have to spell it here. But <laughs> everybody will, will guess wrong. <laughs> yes, everyone. Um, McLean and Turquie.com is my. Um, my website. You can find me on LinkedIn, which is just Cheryl McLean, Cheryl with an S. You can find me on Instagram, McLean Turquoise Designs. If you put McLean and Turquoise in the same sentence, I'm going to pop up. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. That's for sure. Yes, I'm going to pop up. Yeah, absolutely. And then I have, you know, I have, I didn't say I have a boutique in my studio. So I'm here in Laurel, Maryland on Main Street in the historical area of uh, Main Street of uh, Laurel and that's 617 Main and I have a boutique there it's in front of my studio so yeah perfect and and shout out once again to Cheryl's with S's <laughs> last thing here final thoughts it could be a, a quote just kind of words to live by whatever you want send us home here okay let me see send you home like a flight attendant <laughs> sorry no, 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 flight att- <laughs> yes when you see these signs, when the when the things drop down, grab your head. <laughs> so uh, no, just put positive energy out as much as you can because you're going to get it back. It comes back. All energy comes back. So put out there what you want because that's what you'll get. And we have gotten so many, so many, so many, so many awesome tips, stories, uh, advice beyond from Cheryl. Thank you so much, Cheryl with an S for coming on the Wild Business Growth Podcast, sharing your incredible stories in multiple careers. And thank you, Wild listeners, for tuning in to another episode. If you want to hear more wild stories like this one, make sure to follow the Wild Business Growth Podcast on your favorite app. And make sure to do that if you haven't already. It's on, of course, you can find us Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, all the above, including Good Pods, where there's really good, good pos, good, good pasta, <laughs> good pasta, good podcasts and podcast people and recommendations and tell a friend about the podcast uh, this cheryl interview is a fantastic place to start for any help with podcast production you can learn more at maxpodcasting.com and you could sign up for the podcasting to the max newsletter at maxpodcasting.com slash newsletter until next time let your business run wild and turquoise bring on the bongos bongos